Hello, I'm Justine Brown. Welcome back to my bookshelf. Um, please do consider subscribing to my channel and liking it if you enjoy this. Today we're talking about Elizabeth I, The Shaping of the Virgin Queen. Of all the English monarchs, Elizabeth I is the one whose image burns most brightly for us. We can summon her to mind at once, this powerful virgin queen, with her penetrating eyes dark in a pale countenance, curly red-gold hair reminiscent of her father's, long tapered fingers, and graceful upright figure richly bedecked. This image, the result of a decades-long co-production between the skillful rhetorician Elizabeth and her iconographers on the one hand, and the dreaming populace on the other, emerged at the precise time that icons of the Virgin Mary were once more being removed. Elizabeth ascended the throne in 1558. Catholicism's strongly female dimension was rejected by Protestants. For century after century, the English people had cultivated a deep devotion to the Virgin Mary and other saints of both sexes, not only had the Mother of God been visible in every church, there were also statues along the roads and in countless shrines, public and private. People had said the rosary regularly and gone on pilgrimage. No longer. Now these practices were discouraged. Religious icons were smashed and burnt. Imagery vanished in the religious context, only to re-emerge in the political one. The icon of Elizabeth was able to fill, to some degree, the Virgin Mary-shaped hole in the hearts of the people. If she meant to rule England, Henry VIII's second daughter really had no choice but to embrace Protestantism. By Catholics' reckoning, Elizabeth was illegitimate and therefore disqualified as a monarch. She had been forged in a Protestant gesture and she now personified that movement. The offspring of Henry and his controversial second wife, Anne Boleyn, known to Catholics as the concubine, Elizabeth was supposed to have been a boy. Henry VIII had broken with his wife, Catherine of Aragon, her powerful family, and consequently with Rome in a bid for the woman he craved. He had persuaded himself that Anne Boleyn was destined to give him the son who would secure the succession, the son Catherine had been unable to give him. And when Anne became pregnant, Henry knew a son was on the way. It would all be worth it. The years of waiting, the struggle with Rome, and all the litigation that entailed, the doubts of close advisors like Sir Thomas More, the resistance of Catherine, who had so much support from his people, the sheer upheaval. He seems never to have allowed for the possibility of a girl, and yet a girl was what he got. As the imperial ambassador wrote to Emperor Charles V, quote, On the eve of Lady Day, the king's mistress was delivered of a girl, to the great disappointment and sorrow of the king and to the great shame and confusion of physicians, astrologers, witches, and wizards, all of whom affirmed that it would be a boy." Unquote. This enormous letdown was the first in a series of events that corroded his connection to Anne Boleyn. A year later, Anne was in the tower, facing execution. Elizabeth's sex, together with the fact that her mother had died branded a traitor, was a serious handicap, and yet she turned it to her advantage. She was lucky in one respect at least. She had had the chance to study another queen regnant up close, her half-sister Mary. Mary's was the reign that Henry VIII had sought to preclude. It was not just that a female ruler inverted the great chain of being and created disharmony by placing a woman in command over men. It was not just that a queen would therefore lack full authority. There remained the problem of her marriage. If she married a foreign prince, as female royals were raised to do, 
that prince might see fit to annex England. This is precisely what had happened in the case of Queen Mary. Mary had wedded Philip of Spain in defiance of her council with unfortunate results. Philip just saw England as a pawn in his battle to prevent France from outmaneuvering Spain in the fight for the Low Countries. On the other hand, if the Queen did not marry, she would have no heir. Elizabeth had watched as Mary, with her humiliating phantom pregnancy, failed on that count anyway. Mary's example taught Elizabeth to be extremely cautious. A female ruler faced inherent disadvantages, but she also had a unique opportunity when it came to iconography, if only she would realize it. Women lend themselves to image making because the virtues have traditionally been al allegorized as female. Think of justice or liberty, for example. It is a habit of the Western mind to imagine abstractions in female form. The groundwork for the Virgin Queen image was laid early. Er in Elizabeth's life, um, as the historian David Starkey has shown, we see her brother Edward personifying her as temperance with a capital T at a time when Puritanism was coming into vogue in the court. Sweet Sister Temperance, he called her in 1548. Edward characterized Elizabeth as restrained and sober in contrast with Mary, who is portrayed as indulging in, quote, foreign dances and merriments most unbecoming to a Christian princess, unquote. From childhood, Elizabeth showed signs of embracing lifelong virginity. The man who was closest to her over the course of her life Sir Robert Dudley, reported that when they were children, the eight-year-old Elizabeth had vowed never to marry, although this did not prevent Dudley from seeking her hand persistently. A tutor of Elizabeth's, Jean Belmain, gave her a copy of The Virtues of the Single Life by the great ascetic St. Basil. St uh, Starkey notes that the gift must have reflected her personal tastes, as it would otherwise have been a strange gift for a princess raised to make a match to advantage her country. Virginity is today presented merely as negation. One has yet to be initiated into the exalted mysteries of sex. It is increasingly seen as something to be dispensed with by young people. Traditionally, however, virginity has been associated with positive virtues such as fortitude, resolve, and purity of heart. A multitude of Christian martyrs, including St. Ursula and her companions, St. Margaret and Joan of Arc, drew strength from virginity. Virgins held special powers. A unicorn, that symbol of rarity, grace, and purity, could be captured only by an equally innocent young woman. As soon as a unicorn beheld a virgin, the story went, it would lay its head upon her lap and fall asleep. Virginity underscores the miracle of Christ's birth. It also provides a kind of spiritual armor. Crucially, virginity offers liberty from, as opposed to liberty for, physical appetite. These dueling concepts of freedom need better articulation in our age. A virgin sovereign state allows her to preserve free will. Elizabeth was determined to retain the liberty that virginity afforded. This did not mean that she was indifferent to the opposite sex, however. Throughout her life, Elizabeth was drawn to a specific type of man, handsome, flirtatious, and swashbuckling. As a queen, as she maintained good relations with actual pirates. Elizabeth's type is so well known that it is parodied in Blackadder, recall Captain Flashheart. Sometimes the queen skated close to the edge of propriety, but far from allowing herself to get carried away with excitement, she seems to have learned self-control from these experiences. She studied them, rather as she had studied the reign of her half-sister Mary. 
At age 14, Elizabeth was targeted for seduction by the prototype of these men, Sir Thomas Seymour, who had married Elizabeth Henry VIII's widow, Catherine Parr. The seduction ultimately failed, thanks in part to the intervention of her loyal gentlewoman, Cat Ashley, but gossip threatened Elizabeth's reputation for a time. It was, of course, essential for her prospects that she remain uncompromised. In order to dispel a rumor that she was pregnant by Seymour, Elizabeth chose to open her carriage windows as she rode through London cra crowds on one occasion. Later, as queen, her close friendship with a dashing Sir Robert Dudley raised concerns. She, he wished to wed her despite being married already. When Dudley's wife died in suspicious circumstances, Elizabeth sent him away. Later in life, she formed an attachment to the young Earl of Essex, but her sentiments did not prevent her from executing him when he rebelled against her. As we have seen, Elizabeth had to embrace Protestantism if she wanted the throne. And wanted she did. Her decision to remain single can be seen in similar terms. For most women, marriage meant additional status. But Elizabeth was in an extremely rare position, of course. Married, she would have to share power with her husband. Indeed, she might have to defer to him as Mary had done with Philip of Spain. Elizabeth preferred to rule alone. To retain power, she renounced marriage and proclaimed herself wed to the nation. As the years went by, the image of the Virgin Queen came ever more sharply into focus and was widely disseminated. Portraiture was an essential part of the program. In addition to many large-scale works, court painters produced huge numbers of miniatures. Members of the aristocracy were expected to wear them as a gesture of loyalty to the sovereign. An image of Elizabeth appeared on the frontispiece of each state-approved Bible in each parish church. The portraits included various emblems of purity, such as pearls, diamonds, lilies, and moons. She represented a latter-day Diana, virgin goddess of the hunt. In on honor of his virgin queen, the explorer Sir Walter Raleigh named England's New World colony, Virginia. As Queen Elizabeth grew older, her portraits became ageless. Art historians term this the mask of youth. She became calcified in maidenhood. Makeup, considered vulgar in earlier courts, became fashionable under Elizabeth. The more she aged, the more fashionable it became. Each day, her servants would create a portrait in the flesh with the aid of cosmetics such as Venetian ceruse, a foundation made of white lead and vinegar. This poisonous concoction enhanced the requisite aristocratic paleness and hid smallpox scars. Veins were traced in blue to make skin seem all the whiter. Expensive dyes, um, called cochineal, madder, and vermilion, were used to redden her lips and cheeks, and coal blackened her eyelashes. Her eyebrows were plucked very thin. Since a high forehead was considered beautiful, the hairline was plucked as well. Servants also made use of elaborate red-gold wigs and hair pieces. Queen Elizabeth's looks drove fashion, and so women strove to mirror her image. The queen was portrayed in her courtiers' faces. Dudley's second wife, Latisse Knollix, was considered a great court beauty largely because she resembled Elizabeth. Shakespeare's comedy Love's Labor's Lost presents us with yet another kind of royal portrait. Elizabeth saw a number of Shakespeare plays but it is one of two that were written expressly for her entertainment. His company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, performed it as part of the court's Christmas celebrations in 1597. Depicting a light-hearted battle of the sexes, the play offers a number of compliments to the Queen. The plot involves an all-male court resolving to forswear the company of women for three years in favor of study and contemplation. 
It is a rule made to be broken, and they are punished for their error by a group of witty women who emerge triumphant. The main female character, known only as the princess, is described as a maid of great grace and complete majesty. She swears by her own, quote, maiden honor, still as pure as the unsullied lily, unquote, and is associated with moon imagery. Like Diana, she is a huntress. Most significantly, Shakespeare toys with the dramatic conventions which dictate that comedy should end in marriage, preferably multiple, to symbolize the renewal of the community. But Love's Labor's Lost suspends weddings to a later date. The break with tradition is palpable here. In an apparent concession to his guest of honor, Shakespeare hesitates to imply that the princess's story should end with marriage. At the same time, marriage is depicted as still possible, which is exactly how England's beloved, iconic virgin would have wanted it. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. I invite your comments below.